Kevin. Michael. <laughs> so we have a lot to cover. Uh, certainly Brad and Lucas uh, have a lot of expectations in terms of the topics and uh, what we should be talking about. But before we talk about strategy and uh, first party data, before we talk about uh, analysis, machine learning and all of the good stuff, how do we think about uh, winning uh, customers' hearts? How do we talk about really brand uh, strategy before we start uh, talking about measurement itself? In, in very simple terms, I think. I think that's what, because this environment we're in, the complexity of that, the complexity of everything moving means that we really do need to think of things very simply. And, and the, the simplest way I think that we can think about winning customers' minds and hearts is how we win minds and hearts is through relationships, right? It's, it's just building relationships with those consumers. And there are many parallels, frankly, to the relationships we build in our personal lives. And if we can understand that, we can think about how brands can really mimic many of the same things that we do in our personal lives. So when you mentioned the uh, uh, building uh, relationships, uh, why do you think this is where we are now, all right, uh, in terms of wouldn't you argue that relationship is something that we were supposed to be doing over the past 20 years or has our focus on precision advertising and trying to outbid, outsmart somebody with just more data uh, put us on the wrong path? Yes, uh, kind of yes to all of that. I, I think it, um, we always have been building relationships, right? Marketing has always been about relationships. What, what has happened, what I've observed in my experience is that many clients, not every brand, but many advertisers have lost sight of that a bit for favor of collecting data, making more efficient decisions, right? Really kind of thinking about consumers more as a series of zeros and ones than a real human, right? Um, and that's not, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's never really true absolutely through the organization, right? There are always places in the organization that recognize what their brand does and how that brand connects to consumers. But when it gets time to implement strategy, when it gets time to really connect with that consumer, in my experience and what I've seen is that we, we've, the, the data we've had available has become a bit of a crutch, I think, and, and driven us toward, toward much more of a perform performance focus. I mean, it's one of the reasons why in my role where I'm, I'm meeting with, with, uh, advertisers and executives, I have to work so hard just to convince them of the power of brand advertising and why that is important. Um, and, and have so many conversations where, you know, the, the focus of that advertiser is improving that value out, getting a hard calculation, much like they're used to with the kind of conversion data that we can collect through many of the performance uh, actions. That we're taking so it's it's kind of it's yes it's always been a part of marketing right but it, it's sort of we've we've drifted I think a little bit off off course um, because of the the reliance on reliance on data it's perfect time for us to go to come back yeah. yes so since uh, you mentioned relationships obviously the relationship has to start uh, at some point right mm -hmm. And uh, as Brad uh, showcased in uh, his example, sometimes relationships uh, start on off the wrong foot, right? When uh, an organization asks you 10 different questions just to get free Wi-Fi at their uh, airport uh, or for you to give you a 10% uh, discount and uh, you end up having 20 different emails just so you keep getting those discounts. So where does the relationship start? How do we think about the, that making that first step towards establishing relationship with our ideal customer? So the, the relationship begins uh, as soon as that consumer is aware of, of who you are and what you can do, or as soon as they are entering your category, maybe even better. Um, I incidentally, uh, Brad has my cell phone number. He's harmless. He's great. Um, so just wanted to clear that up. But um, uh, it is uh, the, the way that we focus on relationships has to be much like our personal relationships in a little bit of an exchange, right? And so there, there has to be, as Brad's example show, showed, uh, there has to be some reason why you would contribute that information to that relationship as a consumer. Right? And, and, and not many advertisers, frankly, do that well. Um, one example that keeps popping up literally for me is, um, on Twitter, 
I continue to say, I will take less personalized ads uh, or less relevant ads, I think it's the word that they use. I, they, they continue to send me this, this pop-up asking me to, uh, to opt in for more personalized ads, which I know is code for give me your personal data, but there's no compelling reason. In fact, if you read what they've written, there's actually this threat that they imply that they may have to show me more ads if I don't. Um, so, and obviously I know all the economics behind that, but it, it's until they present something that will, I can see the benefit for, I'm gonna to continue to opt out. Um, m more now, I'm just really interested to see if they change their strategy with me at all, and they haven't so far. So since you've mentioned, uh, I want to see the benefit, let's talk a little bit about that value exchange that needs to happen. How should organizations be thinking about uh, the value exchange? If I uh, want to inquire more information about Andrew, who is sitting right in front of me, how should I be thinking about what type of value he would appreciate from my brand uh, in order for me to receive that information? Yeah, I mean, at, at its heart is, is what we know and it's personalization. I mean, that's why I would do it, to, to create a more personal relationship, a more personal connection. That can manifest in many ways, right? It can be, it can be through um, uh, content on the site, it can be through offers, it can be through events, uh, wh whatever a brand could do to create a better and richer experience for an individual um, will, will create that value exchange. The, the challenge for most brands is, is, uh, is in communicating that in a compelling way and making it happen. I, I have lots of examples of brands that have slipped up here, others that have done very well. Could you, maybe you can share an example that you particularly yeah. like just to make it more vivid. Yeah, here um, I'll use, so uh, I was just thinking of this on the coming over. So there are, uh, there are two apparel companies that, that I really like. One of them, I buy a lot of stuff from to the extent that um, they have set up a personal shopper for me who really is just a concierge. It, it, um, she, uh, Tammy is her name. I have her email address. If I have questions, I can send them to her. You know, I, I, in conversation with her, I realize that she gets a commission on whatever I buy. So now I only order through her, right? And, and she is there to just help me with sizing and help me locate um, items and other things. That's a wonderful exchange. I, there's another company that I buy quite a bit from as well, who just recently set me up with a personal shopper. And the way they did that was she sent an email to me introducing herself and telling me that she's already placed six items in my checkout um, uh, bag if I want. And was a very odd way to go about that, I think. Um, you know, she the, the email listed that they had based these pieces on things that I had purchased in the past, but I didn't know her. I didn't know anything uh, about her choices. Um, and so it that really put me off. So, so there's kind of two examples in the same category of companies going about really trying to do the same thing, but in just different ways. I think honestly, like how would we do it in our personal uh, lives and relationships, right? If I was, if I was a personal shopper for someone, like, I don't know that I'd start loading up their checkout bag and just ask for their credit much. card number. That doesn't really seem like the right way to go about things. Um, so I think we can just, some of that logic we, we need to apply in, in crafting these experiences. Well, and it seems to me when we start thinking about crafting the experience and thinking about the value exchange, I think it's important to, to have an idea who is your ideal customer that you are setting up this value exchange for, right? Because if you are treating everyone in a very generic type of average way, then certainly it becomes very difficult to have a, a mesmerizing value exchange because you're just saying that this should work for everyone versus determining this is what my ideal customer looks like and that's why they would be interested in this type of value. Without a doubt. I mean, look, the idea of personalization, as I said, depends on how much you understand of who that consumer is, what their needs are, what they're looking for from you and what you have to offer. but. The companies that are really doing this well understand the value that's created by that consumer. And when I see companies really knocking this out of the park, they have a, a pretty straightforward customer lifetime value calculation that they use 
based on really reliant and accessible data. They decile that, uh, that customer list and then craft strategies across each of those different tiers. I mean, the, the consumers that are at the bottom, they don't stop talking to them. They just talk to them in a different way or they don't invest as much, right? But they really focus on putting their efforts against those at the top. So it's, it's this idea of understand, it's just like our, our personal relationships. I mean, we know how to build that relationship, but you have to find those people for whom you, are, uh, you have the, the biggest connection. Right. It's the same idea, really, for, for brands here. You've mentioned customer lifetime value, and I suspect everyone in this organization knows what this is or have attempted to use it in their organization. Yet a lot of times when I meet uh, uh, with marketers, uh, customer lifetime, and we discuss customer lifetime value, the immediate response is, but it's so damn difficult. Our data is here. Our data is here. Then we, need, we have different models, and now it's, our data science team tells us to use this model or this model. Does it have to be so damn complicated? Or can we just test and see which one works? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we, uh, so the the mark the advertisers that that I experience who are doing this well keep their calculation for lifetime value very simple because they need straightforward data. They want that data to be accessible. They want to be able to grab it whenever and and uh, at any point. They save the sophistication for what they do with it. Right, how they execute on the that insight that they that they earn. So the calculation is simple, the execution becomes sophisticated, and the offers they produce and the messages messages that they craft, how they test those things. Right. When I see, I do meet advertisers to your point who who try to come up with really complicated calculations because they believe that accuracy is most important. It's really not. I mean, you can you can start to to your point. Craft, create your deciles, quintiles, whatever, however you want to segment those those consumers, testing messages, seeing if it's working. Heck, you can you can move people around in your value uh, quadrants to, depending on on how they respond. Right. So there is a simple calculations, sophisticated execution is really the way that winning companies are doing that. To those who are taking notes, I think sophisticated execution uh, is definitely something that we should uh, hashtag and post <laughs> because uh, it seems like uh, it's very much undervalued, right? Uh, especially when we talk about analytics, we tend to prioritize uh, data quality and accuracy versus executing on the data. But let me ask you a question. You've mentioned the uh, data quality, right? So it seems like uh, there's the changes that uh, we are experiencing now we will continue to see gaps in some of the data that becomes available to us. So how can organizations become more comfortable working with imperfect data set? Because I think the idea that we've been chasing for years, I need the data to be clean, otherwise nobody in my organization is going to trust it, is kind of BS, right? It just it is. Yeah, it always can move has forward. Been. Yeah. Um, uh, my friend Avanash Kosick uh, published something um, that said, sorry, Ella. Uh, data quality sucks. Let's get over it, right? And, and that was he published that uh, seven years ago. I mean, it's always been a problem, and it is just one of those things that we we need to push through. It, it is really a leadership challenge, not a data challenge. On top of that, the way cookie deprecation, all the things that we've talked about, um, AT, a, uh, ATT, everything that is is impinging our data collection now is leading us to a, a strategy where where customers advertisers will be connecting more directly i believe with platforms data is google on our platforms isn't compromised i mean we we know everything that's happening in search and on youtube meta's data quality isn't compromised on their platform Right, so it's it's just understanding where the data is coming from, the provenance of those data, and uh, how reliable they are there. So we've talked a little bit about the kind of winning uh, privacy, winning uh, the heart of the consumer. So we've talked a little bit more high level. When they start talking about uh, the measurement component, uh, you've mentioned relationships. Relationships to some might sound a little bit ambiguous when it comes yeah. to well, how do you actually measure the relationships? We can start and say, well, let's measure 
amount of first party data that you have access to and how it progresses. But uh, what is the set of metrics or KPIs that you pay attention to when uh, organizations start evaluating relationships and how well they are doing in creating relationships? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, look, we, we, the, the hallmark of a great relationship is lifetime value and high lifetime value. So, so we're, we're really obsessed with, with that. There are components, though, that um, roll into that lifetime value or, or leading indicators, if you will. I mean, the easiest are just simple, straightforward brand equity measures, awareness, consideration, favorability, purchase intent. Those kind of measures can show us how consumers are, are moving through their purchase journey, how they're perceiving us as a brand and advertiser, and they're easy to collect, right? But we think about those aren't really actionable measures so much. Um, so when we are looking at individual consumers, we really think of them along kind of two dimensions. And we'll, we'll measure those dimensions as loyalty to an advertiser and the emotion that they feel or they express there. And we'll use a number of different data sources. We'll, we'll use financial data, uh, we'll use repeat purchase rate, we'll use a bunch of things that make sense for the business to calculate that degree of loyalty, right? And then on the emotion, we use a lot of social data. We look how they're talking to consumers or talking to other consumers about a brand. And we look at not so much the sentiment that is involved, but the, the depth of that emotion. I mean, similar to like our personal relationships, right? We want, we want consumers to love these brands. Sometimes the people you love, the brands you love upset you and People go to Twitter to express that, as you all know. <laughs> and so, you know, we're not always looking for the most positive responses. We just want depth of, of response. That's what we found to be a, a real indicator of a strong relationship, even if it's not always rosy. Uh, it's, it's still something that is, it expresses that power and that connection that a consumer feels to a brand. So you've mentioned customer lifetime value, certainly one of the most uh, important metrics. Uh, in this room, uh, we have a number of people that work for consumer packaged goods, including my friend Jose. Yeah. And the question becomes, well, how do you measure customer lifetime value when people do not buy directly from you or they go to the store and they complete the purchase there? I see John is nodding. <laughs> so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's, it's definitely more difficult. I mean, that disintermediation of information and data presents a challenge. So, you know, we've we've found a couple ways around it and we found correlation to um, to website actions right that indicate um, stronger degrees of loyalty and purchase we've done that in a way that you know we, we've actually just asked consumers we've surveyed consumers that we've seen go to a CPG website ask them about their purchase habits um, collected that data I mean it would be great if we could collect that for every consumer um, but it becomes intrusive very quickly from us, right? Uh, so, so, but we have seen correlation between those website actions and then the value that they demonstrate to a brand. Uh, so surveying has been the best way that we've collected a lot of that data. And then of course, the social data that we'll collect, it doesn't matter what brand you are, really um, fast moving consumer goods or automobiles, people are out there talking about you. Uh, and so we're we're able to stay on stay on that, pull those data, and, and assess them in that way. Do you have any recommendations about uh, how to do a good job when it comes to social listening? I remember a couple of years ago, maybe it was Ten Radiant Six that was acquired by Salesforce. There are a lot of platforms that were measuring a social media sentiment, right? What people are talking about, and then it seemed like many of them went away, uh, got acquired, and then who knows what happened? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I wind up using open source tools for much of the work that that we'll do. Uh, there's a great sentiment analysis engine from a company in Toronto, not open source, but from a company in Toronto named Luke, L-I-W-C, that, that we've used. I mean, obviously, we have access to all of our YouTube comments and other things, so we're able to pull those things internally. Um, it's... Uh, yeah, there's definitely been a lot of consolidation in that industry and in that market, which has made the data collection a little more challenging. But uh, with the right partnerships, you can you can find the the data that you need and conduct the analysis that you're requiring. And again, that probably you are not looking for a perfect data set, right? Yeah. You are looking for a data set that can help you directionally. Uh, 
no, nothing's posts. perfect about <laughs> social media data. Yeah. It's uh yeah, it's it's typically a mess, but that's what you do. Like it, it's easy to, you know, it makes it easy to collect and sort through um with that expectation that you're not you're not expecting it to be perfect. And it's to that point though as well. This is exactly why we are not looking at positive sentiment as a key driver of brand connection. Uh, because just because someone tweeted something positive doesn't mean they always have positive experiences. Just because someone tweeted something negative doesn't mean that they're they're a consumer that you know will no longer uh, engage with the brand. So we've talked a little bit about measurement. Uh, we are certainly you know, living in a very interesting and dynamic time uh, when it comes to digital. What are some of the trends that you see that you would not want the attendees in this room to miss on? Well, in a lot of them, I mean, there's no secret, right? I, there's the, the, the need for more first party data to, to have a strategy on how you connect with that consumer and build that relationship to execute that well. Um, there, there is a, what we're also seeing is more of a, uh, a lean into automation to utilize machine learning and, and AI to, to make sense of having rather than you know, lots of data depth, thinner, broader data, we're turning to machines to do that kind of analysis and find patterns for us, build audiences and, um, and the like. So um, those are really two, the, the need for first party data, lean into automation. Uh, another trend that, um, that we're really seeing uh, is uh, one that just escaped me, fell right out of my head. And uh, I'll think of it in a second. I don't know. No problem. Um, I will use this opportunity to ask you a question about uh, automation and uh, machine learning. Uh, you know, if uh, we are saying that customer lifetime value gives people heartache, machine learning seems uh, also to have the same effect uh, in the sense that, you know, we all appreciate the idea behind it. But I mean, raise your hand if you feel like you're truly comfortable doing it in your organization. So my question to you, Kevin, is how do we get more people to raise their hands? Yeah. Well, it's it's infinitely uh, testable, right? It's 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 one of those strategies that you can just you can you can test alongside current business practices. You can do that uh, really easily, and and so through that test and learn experience, much like the customer lifetime value calculation, you can you can gain a degree of certainty, a, a degree of comfort, right? And so everyone will be like Tyler, uh, eventually trusting and, and ready to go. Uh, what are your thoughts on attribution model and media measurement? Uh, uh, certainly with uh, deprecation of third party cookies uh, and uh, other limitations, those things are going to become more difficult. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, when I ask how many of you before all of this started to happen did this well, and very few people raised their hands, yet they're very, concerned that this is going to likely change or go away. So how should we be thinking about attribution? Yeah, it, it's it's still very difficult. It always has been difficult. And now it's become even more difficult, right? It, it, the, the tools that we have are really, they are good at answering the questions that they answer. The, the, the problem is far too often, in my experience, I find advertisers who expect different answers from their tools. So an example is a, a marketing mix model. Mm -hmm. Wonderful tool, not really affected by cookie deprecation and uh, in its approach, but far too often advertisers are expecting that to be their single source of truth, that roadmap for future investment. And it, it doesn't answer that question particularly well, right? As I'm sure the room knows, uh, it looks at past performance and says whether it worked or not, at that investment level with that strategy. And that's a wonderful set of information for you. But projecting that forward is a little bit of a leap. And the leap is fine. Any of the tools that we use are going to involve some sort of leap. So what we're finding advertisers do to answer this question of cross-platform comparability and where do I invest my next dollar, using tools like MMMs that are updated and able to handle digital data, understanding what that answer is and what it's not, and then coupling that with, with a tool like a experiments or even a multi-touch attribution model, 
again, with the understanding of its limitations, the challenges that it's facing, what it's working with, um, and using those to kind of triangulate into that ever important question of where do I put my next dollar? And in the essence that uh, data seems to have a lot of answers uh, to the questions, how do we get become better at asking the right questions? Because it seems like there is no shortage of dashboards and organizations keep spending more and more money on Tableau, Power BI, Google Data Studio to visualize everything, but yet are we becoming smarter? Hard yeah. to say. Yeah, that's the art, right? And in, in my experience, that's the hardest thing for anyone to do. And it's particularly hard for any advertiser who is so close to their data, so close to their customer. I mean, you really, you can't help but lose some broader perspective. What I've found to, to be a good answer there is just finding trusted partners who can help you take a step back, bust through some of those biases, help you uh, understand what you're really trying to solve or become that, that, consultant, if you will, to to ensure that you are asking the right questions, that you are receiving the right sort of answers from the data you're pulling and that it all connects. So it's really, to answer your question, it's just, it's to step outside of our own organizations and find support and help from others that we trust. And uh, I love that you mentioned the art of analytics. You actually have this in your book, part four, the art of analytics. <laughs> By the way, I highly recommend uh, Kevin's uh, book on uh, digital marketing analytics. Uh, Kevin, you teach a uh, number of courses on digital analytics at the universities. Right? I suspect that many people in this room at one point or another have to deliver a presentation or explain analytics uh, to other members of the team. And sometimes uh, people are excited about this and sometimes yet again, how many times <laughs> do I have to tell you this? Uh, what is your secret uh, to making this subject uh, interesting uh, and uh, really help everyone get their point across? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if there's uh, really a secret, but there's just some hard learned experience. And, and it, it really comes down to a single word of empathy, just understanding who that stakeholder is, what they need to hear, what they are trying to achieve. We and the teams that I've, I've run here, we always talked about getting to what we call the ask behind the ask. They're coming in asking for something, but what is it they really need? There's also a more foundational piece to, I think, the relationship between analysts and non-analyst uh, business leaders. And, and that is one that, that has to be based on respect. I think the, the non-analyst, in my experience, the way it's always worked best is when a non-analyst business leader comes to an analyst with a problem. That, that leader, they understand business problems. That's their job, right? Better than anyone. They bring that challenge rather than coming and saying, I need a BDI, CDI analysis and a customer segmentation. And they come with the challenge and then let the analysts use their expertise to determine how they would best solve that challenge using data. And that's where, when that happens, it, it really is kind of beautiful. Um, uh, I'm, so, I'm totally nerdy, so it's beautiful for me. Um, but it, what that does is allows everyone to, to the, the non-analyst business leader, the analyst, to really do what they do best and um, harmonize on, on a solution. I think uh, working through a challenge versus just uh, here, give me an answer to this question, yeah. right, that makes it even more powerful. And uh, you know, I think many heard about Simon Sinek, uh, Five Wise. I think it very much applies to solving business challenges as uh, how do you build relationships? Well, why is it important? What else can be accomplished with this? What is leading to that, right? Mm -hmm. Having some of those questions can really make an impact within the organization. Uh, I certainly have a number of other questions, but I wanted to ask any questions from the audience. Uh, uh, anyone wants to ask Kevin a challenging question? Yes, please. So I'm in the B2B space, financial services, um, but I do think B2C or B2B, what they have in common is the desire for audience performance, which we can derive sure. from lookalikes. Yep. And so with kind of this, you know, identity you know, changes that are going on and platform changes, can you give us an insight? And we know that DB360 has an API that's giving us a little bit more audience data back. But when we think of lookalikes and we want to counsel clients about how to get better audience and how to use Google for lookalikes, do you have any kind of teasers for us on the roadmap for that? 
Uh, so, so teasers on the roadmap for lookalike audiences at Google. I don't have any teasers on the roadmap, unfortunately, but I, I can tell you the, uh, the challenge. And again, you said it, whether it's B2B or B2C is understanding who you're looking for. And, and so that gets back to that relationship that you've built, who's most important to you. The platforms can find them, right? Um, uh, and, uh, there is some trust that has to be embraced there in, in allowing the platforms to, to find them. But really, the, I think the, the most important piece is just understanding who is that high value customer, who is the person that I really do need to connect to, um, and, and presenting, presenting that customer in a clear and concise way. So use programmatic, use conversion APIs, and let the platform find your lookalike. Yes, I think that's a perfect answer, okay. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. EB testing? A B testing, okay. Great question. So A-B testing, any kind of guidelines around what to test, when to test, how many to test. Um, it's not, the, the answer is not really. Um, in my experience, what we found is that devising tests and what we're testing, the number that we're testing, really depends on client, on the, the different category situation and uh, that, that advertiser. But sort of the, the advertisers that are doing it well are constantly testing, always testing. I mean, I, I, you know, I, 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 there's a, a great brand up in Canada that I'm working with who is trying to build this always on 24 seven test uh, platform um, and uh, testing across multiple different formats and, um, and platforms. That might be extreme, but this is, to your point, how you learn is through, through the A-B test. The one thing that, that we do see advertisers not always getting right is they'll focus too much on the returns and the performance of the A-B test and just absolutely say which one, which one in an absolute way performed better, right? Which, which homepage had the most con best conversion rate, what, what banner ad had the, the highest click-through rate. Back to our conversation about relationships, what's really important is who is responding to it, right? So putting it through that frame of, yeah, click-through rate for this, for A was 0.3%, uh, click-through rate for B was 0.25, but who was clicking and does the value that's created because of those consumers change, which one I think is more important. The other way that we often look at it is, uh, think of it as behavior tree, right? Obviously you're after, let's say, conversion on the website. Well, in order for you to achieve a conversion or somebody to click buy, they need to go through a certain step of the funnel or they need to look at the product page. And then as you begin to analyze, you can see, well, at these stages, maybe we see the highest friction or we see the highest drop off. Or maybe on this product page, we have the least number of people clicking add to cart. Are they interacting with pictures of the product? Are they looking at the video? Are they scrolling all the way down to read the product reviews? Can we make more read product reviews more centrally focused? I think it's also an opportunity to see how can I reemphasize value proposition. I think that's something that a lot of organizations do not test as much. I think a lot of times we get obsessed about testing the cover of the buy now button. <laughs> Uh, versus uh, testing uh, a larger, broader components. Both are important, but just make sure you do not get stuck testing the color of uh, the page. So I'm interested in what other advice do you have for B2B advertisers, where it's much harder. Yeah. Right? No degree of social listening, people don't talk about my brand, and unless you're a Fortune 500 company, there's just not a lot of uh, attribution you yeah. can find, you're stuck with last click. And we don't have an unending supply of technology. So what kind of general advice to give to B2B advertisers? Yeah, general advice to B2B advertisers. Because you're right, it, it is, it's a different world altogether, right? We, we counsel B2B advertisers to still think about that customer decision journey in the same way that a B2C would, 
Um, there's a model by McKinsey, the consumer decision journey that we like to use. It fits really well with a consumer to uh, a, a B2C business, but it also fits with the B2B. It's just the idea is that that, that purchaser, that, that decision maker is someone different. It's a purchasing agent or it's the owner of a small business or whatever. So the, the elements are still important, right? Um, uh, to your point, they're probably not tweeting about uh, many B2B businesses and brands fly under the radar there, but there is surveying that can be done. There's, there are interviews that can be conducted and other ways to collect those data to find, find purchasers, customers who um, have that depth of relationship that we've talked about already. Uh, so so it, it's still basically the same kind of process, theoretically, uh, just with, to your point, some tweaks on how you execute. And one another example that comes to mind, the B2B organization uh, had a call center. And uh, whenever you call the call center, they ask you, they are likely going to record your message or what you share for improvement. And then they realized, well, we are sitting on hours and hours of those conversations that are never being analyzed. So they ran machine learning algorithm through it and they started noticing a lot of very similar patterns of what people are asking about, what features people are inquiring about. And then they started bringing those to light on the website and they, their communication to the ideal customers. So they found it to be extremely insightful because again, you're sitting on a pile of data that never has been truly analyzed. Exactly right. Jose? Kevin, we've heard a lot about how to build that relationship with the consumer. Something I'm curious about, though, is right now in this age of information, disinformation, it's very easy to lose the faith of a consumer. By no means your false accounts. Talk a little bit more about how you go, at least with Google, when you go with that relationship, instilling that trust in them. Yeah, so how do we, in this world of information and disinformation build trust particularly when it's been lost with consumers well it's you know it, many of the fundamentals that we've talked about that have always been a part of business and particularly in this case jose like on the public relations front are still the same it, it there that relationship needs to be treated as a one-to-one -one relationship with great importance the advertisers that I find who are doing this really well are really actively managing their social platforms and their interactions with consumers. We talked about how we're, we're pulling data and looking at the, the, uh, the depth of emotion, whether it's positive or negative, but you better be sure that when it is negative, there is somebody who's reaching out to those consumers and just smoothing things over. Right? So it begins, um, it begins in a, in, and sort of our general business practices and how we as a brand demonstrate our commitment to privacy and consumers and building that trust there, that's the bedrock. But then it, it executes through very active one-to-one -one relationship management with consumers. Doesn't mean it's easy, right? I mean, that, that takes quite an investment for sure, but it's well worth it. But, but when, when a brand does face some kind of crisis that would lead to a loss of truth or trust rather, um, you know, there's, there is a, uh, activities that, get, that need to get kicked off and in any way that we'd handle crisis management. It's just in our time now, that's become much more important and frankly, something that is, that is put into practice much more frequently than, than before. Yeah, Jordan. Um, so I wanted to like mention, so what I love about this is that, like we're talking about not just like, we're not just talking about privacy, we're talking about personalization, which is wonderful. And like, I know that a lot of people have been talking about like B2C and B2B, but like something that I, I heard many years ago um, in my career is that like, uh, thinking of things as H to H, and I was like, what's that? And it's like human to human. So like you thinking about these things, like it's not just a business. And like, I think what Kevin is saying here is that like he's talking about like those individual interactions and understanding it. Um, but I do have a question, Kevin, like I'm not just saying this, like I do have a question. Um, I um, was wondering, um, like you mentioned um, sentiment versus depth. Yep. 
and I actually I don't really know what what you mean by that. And I'm, I'm wondering if you can expand on it. Sure, absolutely. The difference between sentiment and depth of emotion. So sentiment would be positive, negative, neutral. It's just a, a natural language processing analysis to say what words are they using and in what context. Depth is the strength of those, uh, the, the expression, whether it's positive or negative. There are tools like the LIWC, the Luke tool that I talked about, that will measure that. Uh, so it, it's, and, and what. Yeah, it's just you. Um, it's not liwc.com. They don't make it that easy. But it's you, you just a quick Google search, and you'll be able to, or Bing, um, you'll be able to, you'll be able to find it. Um, but it's it's a it's an academic tool uh, at its heart that is really robust and really well designed. They just released a 22, uh, 2022 version of it as well. So it's a it's a great tool. Yeah. You mentioned a number of different tools and different tactics. It seems like you know, one of the priorities for almost every marketing organization should be not just to increase conversions or opt-in rates, but really experiment and learn some of these technologies because you know, some certainly will sound foreign in the beginning, but do you want to be the last company to adopt machine learning, right? Or do you want to be the last company to do sentiment analysis? Do you probably want to invest a certain percent of your budget into new technology? Do you have any ideas on how to persuade management that might not be bought in into the idea that we should be experimenting with new emerging technologies? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, th I think in my experience, seeing has always been believing so it's um the way we've kind of compelled advertisers who are reluctant to try different technologies or test things are frankly either by saying you know let's let's uh, uh carve out a location and just conduct a test very low risk um, you know, that that is through a partnership with a measurement company that won't cost them anything. Trying to reduce all of those barriers for sure is one approach. The other is, is just uh, bringing in compelling case studies from others that are doing it, to your point. Like that, that idea of, boy, everyone else in your category is operating in this way and learning these things and you're falling behind every day that you're not can be really compelling as well. So it's, it's a... Uh, it gets back to what I said, I think, at near the beginning, too, is that this is another leadership challenge, being able to embrace that ambiguity, dive in and, and trust some of the, the technologies a bit. But to your point, we, we're not we're never asking anyone to just throw a switch and be, you know, um, totally automated all the time. Test that move slowly is is a fine way to approach. It's just what you can't do is nothing, right? And just sitting still is how how you get killed. And I think that maybe is a way to sell it within your organization because a lot of times when a request for a budget, uh, you want these things, you're kind of paint uh, a picture that's maybe a little bit too rosy. I thought it's gonna be amazing, this is going to change everything and the executive management looks at this as well. I've heard that one before, right? Versus trying to sell more of an idea that we need to be testing this and seeing what type of potential and how can we quantify that potential? And the other complexity to that is understanding that, look, the, those that target is moving, right? So just because we test it and, it and it wins doesn't mean it's always going to win. So what you need to adopt is this mindset of continually testing and learning. Uh, but again, that compels movement. Um, just sitting still and not doing anything is the worst thing that, that an advertiser can do. So you've mentioned testing, uh, you've mentioned uh, relationships, uh, we've talked a little bit about execution. Any other keys to success? I mean, that's a pretty robust <laughs> list, right? Um, no, I, I, I think, you know, another sort of message, and this, this was the third trend that I was trying to think of uh, before, um, is the idea that platforms and and the, are are becoming, I think, more and more vital sources of information and data from for brands uh, about consumers. They're not going to connect to one another necessarily well, 
right? Understanding who your, your consumers are on Google platforms is going to be a different exercise of understanding who they are on meta platforms. And so you need someone in your organization that can bind those things together. Um, and whether that is a chief customer officer or a chief experience officer or something like that, uh, those, the creation of those roles and the more power that those roles are getting is another thing that we're seeing as a trend. And I think another thing that, that can help you understand that, that customer even better in this day and age. Fantastic. Kevin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>